welcome friends to this third and final day and our final session of the three day event of the meditation workshop that we have held in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. I'm very happy to see all of you again. It's always a joy to meet fellow travelers on the same journey that I am doing. You are all fellow travelers with me. You are seeking the same thing that I am seeking. So it's very good to meet each other. As I said the last couple of days, what we are doing here is merely a method to verify that the statements made by these great mystics and saints, that the truth lies within us, and we can find the ultimate truth all within ourselves, that these meditational techniques are a way to verify the truth. They are means, not a goal. They are means to know that we have more than this physical body which makes us alive and gives us the experience of this world. That we have something inside this body which looks like part of the body because it is embedded in this body, but it can work independently also. Even when we leave this body, that inner self still is alive. When we are born, that inner self embeds itself into us and provides us along with it a mind, a soul, thank you, a mind and a soul which keeps it alive and also it helps us to see the world, touch the world, hear the world, and use sense perceptions. These sense perceptions are independent of the physical body. Though if we have no knowledge of something existing beside the body, we think they are dependent upon the organs of this body. They are not. Because when we die, they still exist. You can still see with no body. But you don't feel you have no body. You feel still you have a body. But it has no matter in it. Now, am I just saying something based on hearsay? No. All of you can verify it. You don't have to wait till you die to verify it. You can die while living, which means you can have the identical experience of death while you're here. So dying while living provides you proof that there is something more than the physical body that constitutes our total self at this time. And that is why these meditational practices help us to verify these truths. A large number of people have been able to have some experiences by which they feel there is something else. Some people have had secondary experiences, like they say a person died, but we feel the person is still in the house. They say this house is haunted, and we can see the spirit. Sometimes we can see the spirit and it disappears. Sometimes those spirits open doors and windows. They try to at least open doors and windows, but they can't do it because they don't have the matter in their body. But they try to, with their energy, try to do those things. A friend of mine, I hope I have his permission because he's in the audience. <laughs> he was looking to buy a house in Chicago area. And then suddenly the realtor told him a very nice house is available, owned by a lady who just died. And the children are far away and they are not interested in the house. They say, sell it as it is, along with the furniture, along with some unopened equipment like computers. So it was a great deal. And he told me, it's a great deal coming. I said, that's great, buy it. So he bought the house. After he bought the house, he told me, I think that lady is still there. <laughs> because sometimes they see a chair moving, a rocking chair, when there is nobody. She says, the worst thing is when I'm in my bedroom, in my privacy, looks like she opens the door and peeps it. 
that is not good at all. I said, I'm sorry that she's bothering you. I'll come and try to help you. I went and told the lady, of course, they're invisible. I said, please leave this man. He's not used to these things. So the lady left for two months. I, could, I couldn't find any other place, so came back. <laughs> then I said, she must be missing the fact that her children never cared for all the things she left behind, not even the house, not even the furniture. So I said, maybe if we take a piece of the furniture away, she might come with the furniture. <coughs> so my wife and I, we went to his house and we picked up a piece of furniture. And I knew the lady was watching, at least I thought so, if she's interested in the furniture. And we brought the furniture to our house. He got no further problems. We started having problems. <laughs> <laughs> we would hear some strange sound sometimes. She was trying to express herself. Then ultimately, we said we should take her to a nice place. So we brought her to Wisconsin. We had to bring some furniture too. <laughs> I am telling you this story just to say that so many of us have had the experience that when you die, everything doesn't disappear. There is something that stays. During my official duties, I was a district magistrate in one of the districts in India. Somebody told me that there is a very remote place where nobody goes because of a haunted house. The guest house, which used to be a palace of an old prince who was murdered there, looks like the prince is still in a, in a spirit form, in a ghost form, and therefore nobody goes there. I said, I don't mind going there. I always thought that I was very comfortable with these disembodied spirits from childhood. Sometimes when I was a child, I could feel there were other people and I would call them and they would run away. I said, why are you afraid? But that was very young. But then I said, I have to go there. So I went and stayed there. In that old, old house, dilapidated palace, big building, but nobody was there. There was no electric power there. So we had to use some artificial light and we had to I was doing a lot of work in those days, a lot of paperwork, so I was carrying so many of my paper files with me, and I sat inside with that incandescent lamp that I was using, gas lamp, and I was working at night. There were some sounds here and there coming. I ignored them. I was so busy in my own work. It was very hot. There was no electricity there. There were no fans. So we slept outside. So my attendant, who accompanied me. My secretary wouldn't stay there. He said, I'm not going to stay there. He ran away. <laughs> but one attendant was there to do my bed. And he put a bed, and because there were mosquitoes there, he put a net on it. We used to have a mosquito net in India, and it was hot weather. So he put the net, and he said, I am going. I said, where are you going? I am going to the village there. <laughs> and nobody stays here. So I was left alone. So I said, doesn't matter, I don't know if any spirit is here or not. If there is any, it will be all right. I am accustomed to seeing spirits and being with spirits. So I finished my work, came out, and I closed the door. I didn't lock it because it was just a door, there was no lock on it. Closed the door and went and stepped into that net. As soon as I lifted my feet to get into the bed, the door opened. I said, maybe there's no wind or something for the door to open. So I got out of the bed. This is a very old story. I'm very young, I'm talking of that time. And I got out and I went and closed the door again. And I came back. And as soon as I would put up my feet up, the door would open. I said, this is amazing. <laughs> then I recalled that they told me it's a haunted house. Maybe it is a haunted house. And so, I said, doesn't matter, leave the door open. And I tried to sleep soundly, when suddenly, above the door, there was a 
kind of a ventilator. Yes. They have a small ventilator on top of these doors there in India. I saw a huge bird, like a black bird, just flying out of it. I said, oh, now I know what the problem was. It was a bird. So I went to sleep. The morning I got up, there's a very big, thick, uh, thick gauze, steel gauze there. So I thought there was nothing. And how the bird escaped from there, I still don't know. But those people came back, they said, are you all right? I said, I'm fine, the bird went away. <laughs> now, then I told some other officials, now you can go and stay there, there'll be no problem. And there was no problem after that. It, they have also felt that maybe I'm an, uh, what is it called, exorcist? <laughs> but drive away spirits. So in the, when I first came in the 60s to this country, United States, somebody said our house is haunt, haunted. I said, no problem. I'll come over and drive the haunted people away. So I made a visit. They never had that again. The point I'm making is that there are examples of such experiences by many people who feel that when we die, something remains. It is not visible to us. But can we see them while we are still in the body? If they can see us, they can try to contact us, and they do try to contact us. All these things that we are he hearing about their activities, is they are trying to contact us. They are missing us. Maybe we are missing them too, and that's why they are missing us. That is why people come and tell me, my mother died, and I'm missing her. I said, please don't. Don't hold up her progress. She probably wants to go to a higher place, in a better place. You're holding her back. Because if you're missing her, she'll miss you. You wish her good journey. Wish her the best. Say whatever is happening, I wish you, I pray for the best for you. I say that to all the people who ask me about people, uh, their seniors or elders who passed away. That helped them to make further progress instead of trying to pull them back. Some people cry so much, we want you back, we're missing you. And they, with that attachment, try to bring them back. Now the question is, is it possible to verify that there is life after death? I'll tell you another interesting story. Maybe I, I must, should be a storyteller only. <laughs> True story. This is right in the beginning, in the 60s, when I came to the United States. I had to give a talk in Detroit, Michigan. And I came on a fellowship. I came to study at Harvard University. I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I knew many people who had their satsang centers or they had centers where they had meetings. So some of them invited me. But the Detroit one, they had a Ford Motor Company headquarters there. And the Ford Company was responsible for funding part of the fellowship that, on which I came to Harvard. So they had arranged for me to visit their factory in Detroit. The General Motor, which also had a factory, they had a General Motors technical center. And the government had made a plan that if I come from India and I take te technology from here to India, I should also visit their General Motors technical center, which was not open to the public, so I, it was special permission granted by them. So I had an appointment in two places in Detroit. So I tried to make a visit to Detroit at the same time when they were having a meeting on a weekend or something. I said, these satsangis are having a meeting. I'd like to join them. So they, I called the head of the satsang at that time. And I said, I have come from India. And I have some appointments to make in Ford Motor Company. And so I, I'll try to make it the same weekend where you are having a program so I can attend. He said, he talked to his wife said, these Indians, they come and come and try to, you know, exploit us or something, and he's trying to come and so he can stay here or have our food or something. He felt very mad. He said to me, sorry, we are very busy at this time. We cannot meet anybody. We can't host anybody. So sorry, uh, we can't invite you. 
I said, that's all right, but I've already fixed the time on the same date that I found. I've fixed my appointment to go to the Ford Motor Company. They have arranged a guest house for me in the factory. They have also arranged one of the secretaries to receive me at the airport and take me in, a, in their company car, and I have been taken care of, so you don't worry. I went on the appointed day over there, and when I was getting out of the plane, I was coming out, and a man, elderly man, stands in front of me. He says, are you Ishwar Puri? I said, yes, sir. Are you from Ford Motor Company? He says, no. I am the guy, the president of the Salsang here. I have come to take you home. I said, sorry, I have already made arrangements. You told me that you have no time and you are busy and can't see me. So I made arrangements. The secretary is waiting for me. He said, no, it's cancelled. I have cancelled uh, your appointment and to stay in the guest house. You're staying with us. I said, but we have to tell them. He said, told them. The vice president of Ford Company, who is in charge of this factory, he is my son-in-law. <laughs> I said, OK, then you must be right. So he took me in this car. He said, do you know that I have never seen you? I only know your name. I didn't know if you wear a beard, you are a beard, you wear a turban, or what you look like, and who you are, how old you are, young you are. No idea at all. And yet I found you. I said, how did you do that? He said, very simple. I talked to my master. <laughs> I closed my eyes. I said, master, I don't know this fellow. You tell me. When I opened my eyes, you are the next person in front of me. <laughs> I said, you Americans are wonderful. <laughs> I have never been able to do such a thing. <laughs> I have to learn this technique from you. Anyway, we went, went to their house, and there was a committee of sorts, some women, some elderly women, some men sitting and re making ready for a dinner for me. They sat there. I had just come from India, very little knowledge about American customs or how they want to treat their guests. We are used to something different in India. So they sat at the table, and they said, we are very glad that uh, Ishwapur is here from India, his great master disciple, and he will say grace. <laughs> I have never said grace. <laughs> I was stumped what to say now. So uh, just at that moment, a little wisdom came to me, say something in your own language. They won't understand it. <laughs> so I said loudly, very loudly, I said in Punjabi language, Chako ji khana. <laughs> that we eat it up now. <laughs> they all look so surprised. What has he said? Then the host got up. He said, he has said some nice uh, grace in Punjabi. I will translate it to English. <laughs> then he gave a long speech. <laughs> oh, Lord, we are very happy for the food you give us. We are grateful to you. We are very happy we have a special guest come to us from India. We thank you for him. We thank you for the food. Very interesting. So I felt very alarmed because I was already started eating. <laughs> so I had to put the morsel of food back. <laughs> anyway, after that, I didn't know what to do now. So I began to say, they, they are saying, thank you, thank you. Maybe, maybe we should have thanks. Thank for the food. This is a nice, nice thing they are saying. They said, what are you muttering in your mouth. I said, I'm saying, why do we say thank you? How can we thank the Lord? Are we equal to the Lord? 
are we treating the creative power that run this universe as somebody just a person or somebody sitting somewhere they said hold on bring a recording recorder me <laughs> and first time my talks began to be recorded and it's very interesting then they said that we have arranged your talk i said why did you arrange my talk don't you have your own regular meetings they said the regular guy comes his name is mr replogal he comes from chicago and he is sick then we have an alternate a backup who lives here he is gone to india then third one of us comes and that also person is not here so we couldn't find anybody to speak so this committee which is now having dinner decided okay this fellow is coming from india let's get him that's why <laughs> he will tell some stories about india so that is why we are asking you to now speak so it was a veteran memorial hall in detroit they had a meeting they took me there and there i i i got up and spoke when i spoke before i spoke i just closed my eyes for a minute because it was a large unknown audience but anyway i did speak something and there this host was sitting in front when i finished he got up to thank me and he said i know what you did you closed your eyes and you asked your master great master what to say and he must have told you what to say because look like great master's talk i said i tried <laughs> i said let me try the american way that you could find me by closing your eyes and asking i said i will also close my eyes and ask master what should i tell these people and when i close my eyes my master said who are you to be my spokesman <laughs> <laughs> he almost got a slap from him <laughs> it didn't work for me <laughs> he said if i have to speak i can speak you quietly sit down so i quietly sat down and what you heard was in my body but great master's voice so that is why you felt like this but it is not something now while this was going on there was a man at the back standing a jewish man canadian but then he became a us citizen later he was standing at the back i could see him at the end of the hall just standing and smiling all the time i had no idea who he was after i went back i had to catch a flight i went back to boston and at midnight 12 o'clock phone rings my host's wife calls she said there is a man here who is facing life and death problem and he says he has to see you right now and i told her, told him he has been calling me i told him that look that speaker of today has gone back he was not he doesn't live here he came from boston and he's gone back already it's late he said i have to see him right now or i'll kill myself so i had never heard this kind of emergency so i said how am i going to handle it i said is that man somewhere near you she is yeah, sitting here in our house he has come all the way to our house so i picked up the phone i said what is his name his name is lionel fishman i said okay mr lionel what's your problem he said i have to see you right now i said sorry i won't see you right now i'll see you in april i'm coming to chicago to for a bandara second of april great master bandara if you can make it there come if you can't wait kill yourself <laughs> i said these words i don't know how i said them <laughs> he said i will wait <laughs> amazing story now what has actually happened this boy was a jewish canadian boy and he came to new york and he found they were recruiting people for the air force 
U.S. Air Force. This is old story before the Second World War. He got recruited for the Second World War. And he went and he was in Japan fighting. At the end of the war, in 1945, he got married to a, a Japanese girl, Tai. And he loved her very much. They loved each other. And they began to have a good time. They said, we settled back in the United States. They came, first stayed in California, then settled in Denver. One day, this boy and his wife, they were driving their car. And the man said, look how blessed we are. Tai, how blessed we are. We got beautiful house. I've got a beautiful wife who takes such good care of me, such a good cook. She said, I am so happy with you. When they were saying these words, they went into a red light. A truck came, crashed into the car. Tai was killed right there. The wife was killed. This man couldn't believe. How can God, the creator, when we are thanking him, when we are praising him for the blessings he's given us, kill my wife at that time? It didn't make any sense. So therefore, he got into great depression. He had a friend named Morton, and Morton, he called Morton, I can't survive, I have to kill myself to go and see where Ty has gone. I can't believe this thing can happen. He went to the synagogue, met the rabbis, he went to churches, he went to other holy people to find out, do you have any idea where a person goes when he dies? They said, they go to heaven or hell, something like this. They made stories which didn't appeal to him at all. And so he said, I have to kill myself in order to go and find my wife die. <coughs> Therefore, he decided that he took that antidepressants he was taking every few hours. Morton stayed by his side so he doesn't commit suicide. And he said, I am going to kill myself. He had an office in Detroit where he worked on the sixth floor of a building. He said, I'll go on a Sunday. Office is closed. I have the key. I'll jump out of the window and kill myself. So on that particular Sunday, he went up to his office. And he opened the door, locked it up, he locked up his office, and a typewriter. On the typewriter, he began to write the reasons for his taking a step to kill himself. Last minute note. He typed out that he has been to all these people, he's been to rabbis, he's been to church priests and all, and holy people, nobody could answer where I has gone, so I'm going to find out myself by killing myself. I hope God will forgive me. So when he typed that, he moved to the window, opened the window, and saw down and said, it's very easy to jump six floors, no problem, I will kill myself. When he was about to jump, his hand was on a table next to the window. And his hand slipped because there was a newspaper lying there. And he slipped hand, he looked to the newspaper, and local newspaper, and the heading was, a man from India here to tell that there is life after death. <laughs> Heading. It was, a, it was a news about my talk in Detroit. And newspaper had covered that. He said, how can this happen? Just when I'm about to die, something happens and brings a newspaper here? He said, let me first find out what this is. So he read that tomorrow there will be a talk by me. And it will be held in that place, Veteran Memorial Hall. He said, I have to wait till tomorrow, or maybe till next Sunday. So he waited. Now, this is all before the telephone call, which I'm telling you. So he decided that he is to wait till tomorrow. Suddenly, he realized the newspaper is on Saturday. <laughs> and the talk was the same day at 3 o'clock. So when he found that, he rushed, because he could hardly make it in time. Meeting had already started. I was already speaking when he arrived. He was a boy standing at the back, which I saw. He tried to come forward, and there was a long line. After when I finished talking, long line just shaking hands and saying, thank you for coming. So he stood in line. Then he came close to have a look at me closely. And he came, but the line was long. So he went and there were some books being sold, and he bought one of the books, and he began to stand in line. When the line was halfway through, 
uh, the, my host said, sorry, no more handshaking. He has to take a flight. It carried me by my arm. We went out to the car and I returned. And that is when he went home and he said, how could you? He's talking to me himself. How could you do this to me? You sent me a message. And I know that you sent me a message so I don't commit suicide. I have to talk to you. And therefore, I don't know where you are. He went back. The janitor said, we just cleaned up the place. We don't know who came, where they came. They just rented a hall. They rent the hall every month. We don't know who the people are. He couldn't find. He went home. He said, OK, Mr. Ishwar Puri, now it's a challenge to you. If you sent me the newspaper and called me and I have seen you, and you ran away before talking to me, and now you wait and see till next Sunday when I kill myself if you don't come. <laughs> he's talking to him. And as he talked, he knocked like this. The lamp was knocked. This was next to him. And the book was there. And the book fell down. Then he picked up the book to one of those publications by the satsang people. And the page, last page opened. It gave the address of people where you can contact. And he saw one address in Detroit of my host and his wife. And he picked the book, saw the telephone number, and called them. It was midnight. And that is when they called me. So what a coincidence. And he was amazed at the coincidence. But he said, I have to meet him as soon as I can. I'll drive right now, he told them. But when I talk to him, OK, wait till April. Otherwise, go kill yourself. <laughs> what is the big deal? I don't think killing and dying is a very big thing. Anyway, he waited. When he waited, after a couple of months, this was the end of February, in April 2nd, I was in Chicago, and by daughter of great master, I was giving a talk there. He said, I'm not interested in the talk. I want personal interview with him because I prepared a list of questions. I prepared my questions. What is life? What is death? What happens after death? What proof is there? So many questions he had written down. And he said, I have to ask him those questions. So he waited outside, didn't come to the talk. He saw Badara talk, 2nd April. And he was waiting that he has to drive me. He told me, can I drive you to Detroit? I said, I have a meeting in Detroit with an organization called Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship, SFF. And their board is waiting to see me. And the chairman is a woman, and the chairwoman, and there are five, six people on the board. They want to meet me. So they are waiting in Detroit. I don't mind you driving me. I was going to be driven by two other ladies from Chicago. <coughs> he said, I want to drive you because I can then talk to you on the, on the way. And my wife was there. She said, please don't go into that car. <laughs> <laughs> this man is suicidal. <laughs> I said, don't, don't worry. Don't worry. He, he's postponed his suicide. <laughs> <laughs> that should make you feel happy. <laughs> Anyway, they were very worried. And the ladies were to drive me, and my wife in the back car, another car, this guy alone in driving me. And he said, here are my questions. At that time, this was a new drive for me. I had never had a drive from Chicago to Detroit. We go over a long bridge, Skyway or something. And so I said, can't we wait till we get out of town? Please drive carefully. <laughs> he said, no, we can't wait, because I have too many questions to ask you. And we won't have time. I say, how long does it take to go to Detroit? Oh, four, five hours it'll take. <laughs> I said, surely there's a lot of time. No, 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 you don't know. I have very fundamental questions to ask you. I said, please wait a few minutes. Still, I can calm myself down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we drove out. And then I began to talk to him. I said, look, this is a very simple matter. Life doesn't end when we die. Only body ends. Life continues. Then I began to explain how it is. And I said, one can even see those people who have died if we also get into the same state in which they are, which is to be a disembodied person. That can be achieved by meditation. By meditation, when we become unaware of our physical body, we become aware of our inner body. And that is when we can be like them and we can see them. Then they can see us also. 
but they can see us even in physical bodies because the eyes are still there, the same eyes they were seeing with when they were in physical bodies. This sense perception remain intact. So I gave a talk and told them all this and went on and on for about 10, 15 minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then I waited that he'll start his long list of questions. And he was smiling. And we kept on driving. He was quiet. I said, maybe what's happened to him? I hope he's not getting suicidal again. <laughs> <laughs> then we drove for about an hour. And he said, you want a rest stop? Uh, a number one stop? I said, yes, I would like a number one, two. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Whatever they are, number one, we'll have a stop. So we stopped at a rest place. And when we got out, my wife ran from the back. He said, are you all right? <laughs> I said, perfectly all right. Then we resumed our journey. Then he spoke first time. He says, do you know, I have memorized all my 110 questions because I knew I won't be able to read it while driving. I memorized all of them. And I am going over each one of them as you spoke. You answered most of them. And the remaining were irrelevant. They didn't mean anything. I have no question to ask you. I was very impressed. With myself, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I must have done something great. <laughs> I don't know what the questions were. So that is why we reached there. And when we reached there, the board the of directors of SFL, Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship, they were waiting in the house of our host, same host who invited me earlier in Detroit. And this boy says, would you mind if before you start the meeting with them, you can go to my house? <coughs> Ty set it up, and the last time when we went out and she got killed, she had set up a, a place for a tea party that we were going to have with a couple of friends. We never had that party. If Ishwar, you and your wife can come and just bless our house and have the tea, which Ty prepared, we'll be very grateful. I asked my wife, I asked her board, are you, this is a man having his suicidal thoughts and it's a life of death question, and he's requesting me to go to his house and come back. I'll take a few minutes and come back. Will it be all right? They said, it's all right. Go, please. Yes, yes, we'll wait for you. I didn't know the house was far away. We drove an hour and a half <laughs> to his house, and then the tea took place. It was very beautifully done. She was a very aesthetic person, I can tell you, that lady because she decorated the house in Japanese style so beautifully. And we had her tea, which she had prepared. And he warmed up the tea, and we both had. And he chatted a little, and we drove back. I said, those people must have gone back. We'll reach at midnight now. <laughs> so we reached our host's house, where we were supposed to stay. And we saw the board still sitting there. <laughs> and I expressed great Apologies to them. I said, I'm very sorry. I had no idea. The distances are so many here. And I couldn't come in time. So I know you are waiting for me to talk to me. The president was a lady sitting in the center and the four or five people around her. So I began to say, I understand that you have this self, um, this movement, fellowship. And what does self mean? What does fellowship mean? Just talked about 10, 15 minutes about what the title of, the comp of their organization meant. And then I said, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer this. This boy was standing behind me when I was talking. So the president said, she had a paper in her hand. She said, I have no question. You have answered my questions. Then she asked the other members of that SFF, do you have any questions? No. The boy laughed in the back. That's what I was waiting to hear. <laughs> That's happened with me. This is, of course, he did, he got initiated, he got such good progress, and he was able to see his wife. I am telling this old story, very interesting stories, how this happened, how the coincidences occurred. But the point was that if we feel that this body is our only self, we are totally mistaken. And we can verify it right now by simple process of meditation, 
And the process is simple, which we have been talking about the last two days. To recap it, number one, very important point, do not attempt any meditation till you have found the right place to meditate, which is behind the eyes, is the third eye center. Any other place you sit will draw your attention to that place. We want to draw attention, pull the attention back, withdraw the attention back to our own self, which is operating as we are waking and alive in the third eye center behind the eyes. First, practice locating yourself there. Doesn't matter if it takes time. Practice locating yourself behind the eyes. Just see what happens if you feel you are in the head. What other experiences are happening? Let the mind think what it's like. You watch it, watch it. Let other pictures come. You observe them. Let old memories come and go in front of you like a TV screen. Just watch them. But stay in the center. Practice to stay in the center of the head when you are comfortable. And you can go anytime and feel comfortable if the rest of the body is below you, around you, the ears are inside of you, eyes are in front of you, you are in the right place, then only start meditation. Very important point. I missed several years after initiation by not understanding the simple point. And now I find there are some people who didn't miss several years, they missed 40, 50 years without getting any benefit in meditation. A very important point. Second point. Mind thinks, therefore distracts us. Mind is the only obstacle that is coming in the way of your discovering yourself. No other obstacle. There's no enemy outside of us on our spiritual journey except our own mind. Therefore, deal with the mind by repeating your Simran mantra, repeating the words that have been given to you by your own perfect living master, if you have been lucky enough to have those words. Because those words, when you repeat, are not only simple words to substitute the words of thought, they also carry an empowered quality, very empowered quality. They do not allow negativity to come while you are repeating them, even the negativity of your own mind. Very useful. If you have been initiated by a perfect living master and he's given you some word to repeat, they are not ordinary words anymore. They become empowered when you are initiated. And those words prevent negativity to come. Even you can use them for outside negativity. It'll, it'll go away. So that is why use those words and repeat them with the mind, not with the tongue. In the beginning, you start with the tongue. You can't help it. Later, the tongue will move along with your repetition. When you think, tongue doesn't move. How come when you want to repeat those words with the mind, the tongue moves alongside? Because the mind doesn't want to pick them up. The mind resists. Mind will fight. Mind is the only thing that fights you during the spiritual exercise. So therefore, practice repeating those words in the mind. Next point, when you repeat, repetition is not enough. Listen attentively to those words. Listening attentively draws you to yourself because the soul, your real self, is a listener, not the speaker. To speak, it has been given an agency, that's the mind. So that is why when you repeat with the mind, listen attentively. The more attentively you listen, the more you are drawing your attention behind. At some point, if you are doing it regularly, you will be able to hear sounds inside, several sounds. Some sounds are very coarse, like a thunder, sound of thunder, like sound of a truck going outside, like sound of uh, some bricks falling, something like a, uh, like a shower going on, like waterfall. All these sounds are being generated from either the physical self or the astral self, sensory self, and they do not come from the self. Most of these sounds are not in the center, but they come from the sides. Many sounds come from the left side, many sounds come from the right side, some come from the center, and some are undefined. They look like surround sounds, they come from all over. When you hear these sounds, if you only hear some sound from one side, whether left or right, start listening to it or practice. Practicing also helps you to withdraw your attention 
to your own self inside. And once you are able to withdraw attention to some extent, the real sound will start coming from the self. We are so far distracted by outside sounds, outside, outside experiences, that it takes a while to get that real sound from the center. The real sound center will be like it's coming from where you are at the third eye center or a little above it. Because the space here, where you imagine you are there, the space creates yourself and in a space like this, not like this. So that is why the side sounds are only very temporary and for practice. If you hear sounds from both right side and left side, prefer the right side. Because so that's the intuitive side of the brain, the left is the reasoning side. It just helps a little bit. I had a friend of mine who told me he had been listening for 15 years the sound from the right side. He was told the right side contains the real sound and the left side contains the negative sound. I don't know how this message has gone around. There's, the ears have to hear. When the real sound comes, you don't even know where the ears are. You are trying to withdraw your attention from the body. How can you confine yourself to one side of the physical body and think that you will escape from it or get out of it. Therefore, both right and left are not the real sounds. The real sound comes from the center. It's coming from your own self. And the sound is not coming from the physical self at all. It's coming from internal self, a third eye center of the inner body, which is also there. It's coming from the formless body, of the mind, which is also there, is coming from the soul, which is also there, is coming from your true home, which is also there. It's therefore, the deeper you go in that place, that is, everything will open up from there. So don't go to right or left sound, go to the center. Practice for a while. It is not, this is not very simple thing. We have just done exercises here. This was very little time. Practice for a while in these stages. When the sound comes and is strong enough, sound that resembles the bell, large big bell sound. Little bells will come earlier. Uh, when the little bells come, you are ready for getting the big, big bells. Chirping of crickets comes a little earlier than these little bells, then the little bells go into. Sometimes they mix up and several sounds can be heard at the same time. But play with them. That means listen to one, listen to the other, see which one is close, which one is far. This bell sound looks in the beginning, it's at a distance, coming from a distance. Others are all very close. So when you pick up that, it's, it has a greater melody. It's more melodious, it's more attractive sound. When that comes up, pick up that sound and try to listen to that. When you listen to it, it comes closer and closer to you. It looks like it's coming closer. Actually, your attention is pulling it. Your attention is going closer to it, but it looks like the sound is coming closer to you. When you can hear the sound regularly, listen, that's your meditation. You can drop even the words unless you are feeling the mind is bringing something negative. Repeat the words to take care of negativity and keep it on the sound. Sound alone is enough for meditation. Then after you practice this mechanical side of meditation, then you begin the real thing, the dhyan part, the contemplation of the master to bring love and devotion in your meditation. You will not be able to cross the mind if you do not bring love and devotion into the meditation. Love and devotion is the secret of meditation. If you have love and devotion with true faith, with no doubts in your mind, nothing else is required except love and devotion with 100% faith. All these things will create faith slowly in you. When the faith is complete, nothing else is needed except you are constantly remembering or your master with love, and that can take you to your true home. Every time you have this experience of love, meditation becomes better, and you can check it out. So that is why love and devotion should be introduced as soon as you can, when you stabilize yourself at third eye center, are able to repeat the words, are able to hear the sound, and then express your love and devotion, and visualize, not from your imagination, visualize your beloved master from the way you actually saw him, the actually meeting him by memory. Because that was a real person that you are remembering. If you make it up, that's your mind making it up. But if you remember something, that's what you actually were living. 
a living person you you met and therefore you were able to recall or remember which also makes it clear for many people am i initiated if i have never seen my master i have to say sorry you are not you have to wait for next year next life because this is it is essential to be able to have the contemplation of the master for having a real that stage of love and devotion which it all takes you about you can go part of the way without that you can go even up to the causal plane with great effort but not beyond that to go to a true home we need the actual experience of a perfect living master being remembered by us with love and devotion so make that part of your meditation so these are some of the steps that you can take if you do your repetition of words as a habit by walking while doing other things while cooking while doing other chores it becomes a habit that you don't have to try to do this it happens automatically if you start hearing sounds regularly you'll be hearing them all the time whether you're meditating or not so two of the parts that i'm mentioning are automatic if you love your master you'll be remembering him all the time that's also automatic so meditation is automatic way of living you just have to do battle the mind which is taking you away from this when the when the experiences are good even the mind starts loving it then even mind doesn't become an obstacle but becomes a friend of yours and wants to have more of that experience that's the best stage that will come in your life automatically if you just follow this steps of meditation later on you will see that you are seeing master in everything that is happening now remember <clears throat> spiritual progress cannot be measured only by what you see inside sometimes you don't see anything inside you are busy with your work but you see masters handed everything outside miracles are happening outside nothing is seen inside you say i'm not making progress i'll tell you two stories i thought i had finished telling stories but no <laughs> a couple of stories about what we can see let me tell you the story of my master's master this baba sawal singh was my master he was initiated by another master named baba jamal singh and baba jamal singh was a soldier and he very retired he was very keen to have more experiences he was initiated by a swami ji from agra states shivdyal singh who was uh, popularly known as swami ji starting the raza swami line of masters he was his initiate one day he wrote a letter to his master beloved master i am missing you please give me time when i can come and see you in those days mail took a long time so he wrote that letter to his master swami ji and waited for a reply took a month or so for a reply to come and swami ji wrote to him my beloved son jamal singh i am very happy to get your letter and to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions and jamal singh said my soul goes nowhere i am having no experience at all and what is this swami ji writing so he wrote another letter he said beloved master my soul goes nowhere i am only missing you i just want to see you i am missing you so much i can't wait to see you please give me time to come and see you this letter which you wrote must be for somebody else he got a rather reply he says beloved son chamal singh i am very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher regions and so far as coming to see me is concerned you can come in the first week of next month he said how can swami ji write these two letters my soul is going nowhere and how did he write this so he takes those two letters with him and goes on the first week of next month to see his master swami ji in agra and he goes there and places the two letters at his feet and he says master you sent these two letters they were not meant for me my soul did not go anywhere the swami ji said oh really let's go in and meditate a little the 10 15 people were sitting outside he was sitting outside it was good weather 
so he took jamal singh inside his chamber for maybe half an hour or so and they both came out and then swami ji said now tell me jamal singh when i wrote that letter that your soul was roaming in high regions was it roaming in high regions yes master it was i am not asking whether your soul was roaming around in the half an hour we meditated i am asking did your soul roam around in high regions when i wrote the letter to you he said yes master my soul was roaming around at that time when you wrote letters other people were surprised what they are talking about so then swami ji explained to the other people he said we have come with a bundle of tasks and obligations called karma we have our life in which we have obligations and we do lot of things in this physical world to fulfill our karma we all have to do it some have a heavier load some have a slightly lighter load we all have a load and obligations require that we have to work outside in this physical world masters know that therefore while you are busy there if your attention is pulled into higher experiences all the time you may not be able to fulfill all the obligations required outside and therefore may have to come back again just for the sake of fulfilling some obligations masters don't want that they want you to clear your accounts here before you go to a true home therefore they put a blinder on you sometimes while you're having an experience inside that's what makes you feel you're missing your master that's what makes you feel you miss your master so much so therefore when you miss your master so much it's not merely an indication that you're missing because you love him it means you're making progress inside when later on you are able to do meditation and go inside you remember that that is when you are able actually seeing those things your own memory comes up at that level and you remember when you are missing master that's when your soul was actually ascending inside but the blinders were not letting you see it so then the blinders are removed you can remember yourself where you were so this is an example which he gave that we do not always have an internal spectacle to judge if we are having a higher progress in our meditation sometimes external experiences tell us our feelings tell us what is happening more and more coincidences take place when we make progress on meditation so there are several ways in which you can judge progress so do not worry if you have come to believe only inner visions can tell us if we are making progress that is not true if your if your job require more work outside then inner visions can come later on at the right time but you pay off your karma and you pay off your accounts that we have to pay to negative entities to run this universe we are not in our true home we owe something here let's finish our accounts and then we can go back second story is of another gentleman he is the daughter married to my uncle so is part of the i knew from a family relationship also his name was devan dariyalal he written some books very nice books on spiritual path he was working in one of the small states kapurthala state which is very about 20 miles away very close to the dera where great master gave his discourses so the riyalal was a finance minister of his state he was a judicial officer he was a judge for a while he was also in some other high positions in the state highly educated person and he was following the master was initiated by him when he retired from his job he came to great master he said master i have retired i want to be around you here now so give me some seva some service to do in the dera great master said devan saab dreyai lal you are such a highly educated person have so much experience you can take any job you like you can become the secretary of this organization you can take care of all the administration that is run here whatever job you want you can take and the riyal lal said no sir i only want to be your doorman if i can stand outside your door and i want that job great master smiled he said all right and the rest of his life he spent standing outside the door of great master's house <clears throat> he was very happy he saw people 
tears in their eyes with so much love and devotion coming to see great master he could believe there can be such so much devotion existing in this physical world and it was very inspiring for him and he did that seva with great humility one of the most humble people i have seen wonderful person after a few years he tells great master master i have enjoyed my job which you gave me the seva was so wonderful but i suddenly realized i missed out on my meditation instead of meditating i was just standing outside your door i understand master this summer you are not going to your usual hill station where you go every year which is in a town called dalauzi and you are not going to dalauzi this year can you please give the keys of your house to me i'll go for three months and i'll meditate every day and catch up with what i missed out <laughs> great master said certainly here the keys go so he took the keys of great master's house and went up to that beautiful resort dalauzi and he said i am going to meditate for three months day and night and catch up with all the lost lost time they could not meditate earlier and then as soon as he opened the door of the house a man comes running and the plumber i was waiting for somebody to come i have to do some work here so he started his work making some noise more people came and disturbed him he could not meditate at all he tried very hard every day there was so much distraction he said what am i doing i am wasting my time after three months totally disappointed he went back to great master and he said master here are the keys of your house i failed i failed in what i was supposed to do i could not do proper meditation great master laughed he said you did not fail you passed he said, how did i pass he says you found out it's not in your hands even to do meditation even that is grace of a mast he said this is our own mind our ego that says i can do more meditation i can do this or that this is all ego there is no place for ego on this path and therefore we have to submit to his grace and his blessings that give far more than any effort that we can ever make so he passed now here again is an example where we start thinking it's the meditation that will give us everything if we are constantly aware of our meditation i am going to meditate i am going to meditate more i am going to give 8 hours of meditation today imagine how strong the i is growing the ego is growing how strong we are making our own mind we are not submitting to the love of a master who alone can do everything and when we do one step small step he can do 10 steps sometimes 100 steps for us and we don't realize that it's a the ego is the face of the mind it comes in our way that is why there is nothing like a blessing from a master there is nothing that he can bless and makes us greater progress love and devotion is a sign of progress missing a master is a sign of progress meditation is merely a method great master used to say meditation is like a thermometer a thermometer doesn't give you fever it only measures it and progress is like a fever therefore you can't use a thermometer say you got fever you can know how far you are gone with meditation you can measure where you are going but you can't say meditation takes you there so that is why there is a limitation to the efforts a mind can make even in meditation so it's a good story to remember that the subject matter of spirituality is very limited to love and devotion love and devotion blessings of a perfect living master who comes in a human form who is he as a human being he looks like ordinary human being maybe little enlightened or something that's all we can think he is the he is the creator himself in a human body takes time we verify this by meditation when we discover we are all creators of the entire creation but we are not but we are sitting in part of the creation as thinking that we have to see from one point of view even a soul is not separated from the total it's always together i try to give a very crude simple example of a glass of water 
I say, a glass of water. One glass of water. There are not two, not three, four, only one. I can see one. If you see two, that means you had too many drinks. <laughs> you know that. You know that. A father was telling his son, son, don't drink too much. Because if you drink too much, these two glasses will look like three. He said, Dad, I can see only one. <laughs> this glass of water, <laughs> this glass of water contains drops of water. I can see very small drops of water hugging each other and all loving each other and beautifully sitting in this glass of water. I can also see just one glass of water. I can see one and I can see many. What is making one into the many? Nothing here in my awareness. My awareness is making the one. My awareness is making the many. I can reduce the size, very small drops. I can make bigger drops. Awareness is creating. I shrink my awareness to one little point and say, one drop of water. All are together. Our souls are like that in our true home. The souls are all one, but they're made into separate for an experience of love. That is the whole thing, but they're all together. They're loving each other. They're all together. They're beautiful experience. The one and the many are the same. And then we are talking of a state where there's no glass and there's no space and time. It's all happening in the one. So that is why, please do not think that the meditational techniques by themselves will lead you to a true home if there is no blessing and there's no help from a perfect living master. And moreover, as I said in the beginning, I gave you the truth. The truth is when a perfect living master accepts you, says, I initiate you, I accept you, I will take you back to your true home, your part is over. Great master, or perfect master's work starts. So, but we, our mind doesn't accept that. Therefore, he says, okay, verify. Verify, this is the truth. The more you verify, the more the truth comes up. The ultimately, you get to the same state as the master, and you find the master was right from day one, not, the, not when you realize it. I'm very happy to share all these experiences with you for these three days. Our program ends here now, and I will uh, be able to share some prashad. Prashad, you know, is blessed food. We have been getting it from Great Master. It was blessed by him, and we used to get it, and normally puffed rice we used to get, and we used to take a little bit of it every day because it was to remember the Master. Remember, Prashad is merely something blessed by a master. I am going to invoke the blessings of my master, Guru Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, before I can give you this Prashad. So it carries very important blessings from my mind, of point of, my point of view. It's a very big thing to have that Prashad and take a little bit of it every day so you can remember this event. It does not change the molecular structure of the product. I want to clarify. Because I know some people say, my child was sick, I gave little prashad. You should have given the right medicine, Tylenol, whatever you give for fever. You can't give prashad to cure illnesses. But you can give prashad to remember, remember the blessings of a master. That does help. So prashad is to remember the blessings we have. When we look at our own lives, especially after initiation, we see, notice so many changes that have taken place all blessings of Master. When we recall them, our love and devotion increases by itself. When we remember our own life and our own events, then our love and devotion increases. So people ask me, how to increase your love and devotion? Remember the Master. Remember what happened. Look at every day. Look what things are happening, which you can easily see Master's hand in that. They, they go against the law of probability. Improbable things happen, coincidences happen. And we can see the hand of the Master. Every time that happens, our love and devotion grows inside. So that is why, thank you very much for joining me. I'm so happy to see all of you. And after this, uh, we'll be having a break, lunch break. You are free to go whenever you like. And I hope you have a nice journey back to your, to your homes and later on to your true home. <laughs> and I'm very glad that I was able to tell you a few stories today, but the basic thing still remains 
लव एंड डिवोशन इज स्पिरिचुअलिटी विदाउट दैट देर इज नो स्पिरिचुअलिटी रेस्ट इज मेंटल गेम्स सो मेनी ऑफ अर्स आर प्लेइंग मेंटल गेम थिंकिंग वी आर मेडिटेटिंग विदाउट लव एंड डिवोशन नो रियल मेडिटेशन नाउ दे ब्रिंग द प्रसाद हियर्स सो आई कैन इन वॉक द ब्लेसिंग्स ऑफ माई मास्टर and then they'll distribute it to you